Signore e signori, buonasera. Grazie per la pazienza di aver aspettato fino adesso. It's a cold morning in January 2021, 20 miles north of Zurich, Switzerland. A pair of round blue eyes are staring at me with skepticism and suspicion. The owner of those blue eyes, Thomas, asks me two questions. And after my reply, he says, Ha, it's never thought. I, I thought, what, what could be the, the worst case scenario? And then I just said, okay, well, let's see. Can you guess what happened 12 months later? I should have a, <laughs> a clicker. <laughs> Any clicker here? <laughs> This is Thomas. It's a scary guy. This, I think you Italians, you all know what is, it, what is this. It's made here in the region and then aged here on the glacier. So basically this is one of the purest wine in Europe. This, this is a glass of water. I collected some snow today, just here outside on the Mont Blanc glacier and I make it melt. This is the purest water in Europe. And this is the Fontina cheese. Happy cows in Valle d'Aosta drink this water to provide skillful cheesemaker the milk to make this wonderful cheese known as Fontina cheese. These products have something in common. Are all from the region, okay. But there is something that it's much less great, let's say. Much more uh, grave. They contain plastics. They all contain plastics. Say this, these are tadpoles or baby frogs. Brazilian scientists looked into their blood and what they found are these tiny balls, microplastics. This is PE or polyethylene to be precise. This polyethylene is the signal that there are also other kinds of plastic, what we call nanoplastics and plasticizers, which are much, much more little, like invisible. We cannot just measure, but we know they are. And they are much, much more dangerous because this little thing has the extraordinary power to pass the most powerful barrier on our body, which is the barrier between our blood and our brain. So they get through this barrier, infiltrates our brain, and do God knows what. University, Polytechnic University of Zurich tested uh, in the last few months all the waters of the lakes here, around here, like three miles from here. So the purest water in Europe, and what they found? Microplastics, again. Do you know what, what does that mean? It means that actually, if we have nanoplastics and microplastics and plasticizers into these lakes, we have it everywhere, everywhere on the planet. And they cascade into the Fontina cheese, into the water into the coffee you just had, and then in our brains. Where the plastic comes from? Packaging. Packaging is the main source of plastic pollution in the world. How? Is there any solution? What about paper? I mean, it's 2022, and we're still using plastic. We know the, the problem of plastic, right? But we know there is a material that is almost like plastic, right? It's paper. Well, someone I see uh, looking at me, thinking that I'm crazy, that paper gets soggy and it's weak and gets dirty. And I, I'm, I'm not debating this. I, I'm aware of it. 
This is actually the problem of paper. And this, this is the problem my company, Patcut, is resolving. We at Patcut work every day to develop this chemical compound. We develop this chemical compound that provides paper with the same properties of plastic at the same cost, but it remains pure paper. So if you throw it away in your backyard, it composts. It biodegrades naturally and it's infinitely recyclable. We work every single day to help the industry to phase out single-use plastic packaging. We had the word to phase out plastic, to solve the plastic problem by providing packaging for the recyclability, a complete biodegradability, and of course, no plastic at all. And today, I'm going to tell you how I got there. My story started uh, in a village very close to here, and it's a 600 people village. There is a nice church, a castle, um, some vineyards, and one coffee. I, I, I'm an accountant, so I graduated as an accountant in a local high school. And then, and then I left. My mom was worried. Why you want to go there in the big city to do computer science? Can you stay here and work just at the local post office? You know, I started computer science and I liked it a lot. I was very interested in it. After six months, the boredom of computer science was too painful. To the point I cannot sleep overnight anymore. So I dropped it out. My mom, you're being lazy. Just make an effort. Uh, I restarted academia. I restarted a new faculty, architecture. Architecture was great. And after two months, become boring again and left. And my mom was crying, was just desperate. And I ended up for doing some little job and then restarted once more. This time, automotive engineering. My mom, super happy. I will have a son engineer. That's great. After a few months, I learned everything I knew everything I needed to know. And then, and then boring again. And so, and so I just left. I left and, of course, my mom was desperate and started uh, one, two, three companies. Get a normal job. What are you doing? And then I ended also one, two, three companies. That was intense. And sometimes also painful. There was I, I good at that. And, and, and I was at what, uh, it's what I did. So uh, when I was 29, maybe, I was too tired. And I just listened to my mom and said, okay, Manuel, let's do the right thing, get employed. And I got employed. I also went to an apartment, furnished it. I found a hobby. I went to the gym regularly. I went to work every day, of course. And actually, in the next, in the eight, this 18 months of employing career, I changed three jobs, two houses before to move to the third, moving in with my uh, ex and, and her child. And I also enrolled college. I enrolled business school, pressed by my ex mother in law, Vies Bumashke Tikakashka which means that you're shit if you don't have a diploma. So this pressure made me enroll, and I also finished this business school. So I got a diploma. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, 2018, I was in a bike ride, and I had a cereal bar with me, like this. And then I ate my cereal bar, I opened the wrapper, and I put the wrapper back in my back pocket. And then, and then I, when I was home, I didn't find the wrapper anymore. Wait, shit. Uh, I, I contributed to this plastic pollution. I am responsible for all those microplastics everywhere out there. We are all responsible with our behavior of this 
ecological catastrophe. Who can disagree? Who can? Who disagrees with that? Please raise your hand if you disagree. I actually disagree. I do disagree. We are not responsible. We are not responsible at all because we don't have a choice. Do you really have a choice to buy the same cereal bar without plastic? Without the plastic wrapper? <laughs> Go to the supermarket. If you want to buy something, you have to buy it in plastic. So plastic is everywhere. We don't have the choice. And, and maybe you would tell me, yeah, but you know, the recyclability, you put it just in the right bin and you will have a great uh, end of life. So we will have a back package again. It's a chimera. Plastic recyclability do not exist. Less than 5% of all the plastic ever produced has been recycled to today. Ever. Meaning that 95% of the plastic ever produced ended up in the environment, in waterways and landfills, and in our brain eventually. We're not responsible. We can complain, but it won't lead us anywhere. So what I decided to do is to act. I went home that day and told my ex, look, I'm going to find a way to package everything with just pure paper. Pure paper is great. It's just cellulose. It can't end up in our brains, right? It biodegrades. It's, it's a sugar, basically. And it's infinitely recyclable. And that's what I did. And I started one first company uh, with some partners. But it didn't work out for a simple reason. People, most of the people, are more interested in making a lot of money instead of solving problems. Therefore, I restarted the company all alone. And what pushed me against everyone's advice are these three questions. If it's not me, who? You're crazy. Think of your life. You're 30. You can do much better with your life. Nobody will solve this problem. Yeah, but nobody. But if it's not me, who? And if it's not now, when? Impossible. Why? Why should it be impossible? So I met a number of famous chemists in my solo company, tried to partner in and develop together this solution. And they told me, ha, ha, ha. It's funny. Good idea, but it won't ever work. And if it, but if it works, it will be great. They were not the first, not the last to have fun of me back then. I also met the, the biggest chemical company in the world. They told me, with our 130,000 130, employees, we, will, we would already found a solution if a solution would exist. This, this, if it would be as, as easy as it, as it looks, somebody would have already done it, that's the most common rationale behind everyone. It's, it's the biggest self-inflicting limitation to innovation. Why that? So I started. I started my career in chemistry. Uh, I'm an AI designer. I'm an automotive engineer. I'm not a chemist. I just make out uh, a makeshift lab in my kitchen all alone. I was sure that the, the concept was right. The only thing is failure. Okay, you need to accept failure or even more. I slept here on this sofa for months. I actually found no investors, of course. Nobody would believe that you can create something that revolutionizes the whole packaging industry into this space. I slept there breathing my my failures every day were scientific experience that, that got failed, that didn't work. Work, 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 a bit of luck, and then work again, and then a bit of luck more. One day, it worked. Finally. So I got finding investors, and, and nobody believed that. Nobody believed me, nobody put money. Okay? Because when you have this background, you can solve the, one of the biggest problems of our times. Fine. All the money I have was 1,000 euro 
and I invested in my company and I created my company with an initial investment of 1,000 euro. And I started like this. A few months later, the first revenue, the first cash was coming in from customers. Customers were the most interested to the solution of this problem and they saw that it worked. They didn't, didn't care about my background or where it come from or if I was sleeping on my sofa or in a five-star hotel. And then when, when they start saying, I love it, it's amazing, it works, it really works. Give me a contract, give me exclusivity. One, two, three customer that says that, I said, I made it. I, I did it with 1,000 euro investment, with a makeshift lab in, in a studio, I made it. It's not fin it, it doesn't finish there, right? I mean, you need to go to the market. Well, today, 19 months passed when everybody laughed at me and told me that it was impossible. 19 months ago, what we do was impossible. And now we do it every day. This week alone, 120 million packs are manufactured with pure paper. With just pure paper, thanks to Papcot's technology. Today, Papcot is deploying in Europe, US, and China. We have a customer all across the world because we dare, because I dare. I dare to defy the society, I dare to defy the most common known. If somebody, if it was so easy, somebody would have already done it. Why? I dare to defy academics, I dare to defy the biggest chemical companies, investors, banks. Getting out to the market with the most revolutionary pro product of the world, made from, from an, by a known chemist from a makeshift home lab. To there is the key, is the key to achieve meaningful success. There is no other way. To there is listening to everyone, but keep pushing, being motivated, being obsessed with what you achieve. How to dare? How do you dare? How you can dare? Three simple steps. The first one is define your target. What's your finish line? What, what's your goal, your end goal? And then second step is to understand what's separating you from where you are to where you want to go. This is by far the most difficult part because here is where you need to understand and to accept who you really are. You need to accept that there are a lot of things, a lot, that you don't know. A lot of things that you need to learn, you have to learn. A lot of mountains to climb, hurdles to face, and obstacles to it, but especially and above all, failures to cope with. Once you accept all this, if you're still, if you still feel the power, the energy, the drive to get what you want, where you want, to go beyond this finish line, beyond this target, then the third step is easy. It's just do it. Just go out there and do it. And be obsessed by doing it, by achieving it. Being obsessed, nothing else counts. The only thing in your life is getting what you want. And this is how to dare. Now you remember Thomas? Thomas that morning asked me two questions. Are you a chemist? Oh, no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, uh, have you ever done this before? No, no, I didn't. It was Papcot's first industrial trial. Ah, it will never work. So months later, Thomas, that Thomas, became my first customer. Became the first customer of Papcot and enabled the growth of Papcot. Now, as I told you, Papcot is de deploying internationally. We have maybe 100 customers across the world. Plastic is part of the past because we are providing a solution that everybody needs, that nobody can ignore, 
It's can, they can't ignore it because it's at the same price with the same performance. Just much better at the end of life. It looks like a miracle. But it's, it's not a miracle. This is not a miracle. This is the story of a guy who dared to defy academics. Who one day told to himself and to the world, if, if it's not me, then who? If it's not now, when? Impossible. Why? Thank you.